Hear now the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 40. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it is reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Now, as we come into the second half of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is essentially seeking to apply everything that he had written in the first half of the chapter. So we've spent several weeks looking at a lot of uh, doctrine and theology, particularly about this question of, of whether or not to speak in untranslated tongues in corporate worship, public worship. And now Paul says at the beginning of verse 26, what then, brothers? What should we do with all of this? How should we apply this? And so what we should have seen from even just the first reading of it this morning uh, is that this section is much more practical than the doctrinal instruction uh, that we saw um, in, the, in the first half of this chapter. But even though these are practical instructions in many ways, uh, it doesn't mean that it's very easy to apply directly what this passage says in all its particulars to our worship in public. Um, and there are two reasons for this, really. The first thing that makes this a challenge to apply the very practical passage here is that Paul is clearly not offering a comprehensive set of instructions for what we should do when we come together for public worship. And here's how we can tell this. Look back at verse 26. So Paul says, what then, brothers? And then he says, when you come together. And then he goes on to describe what they should do when they come together. Well, that word for come together is a word that we saw earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. Paul used it five times to talk about when they would come together for celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so in this passage, we look at this and we say, well, is the Lord's Supper anywhere? Where does Paul talk about that? And Paul doesn't mention it. So Paul clearly doesn't mean for this to be a comprehensive, exhaustive explanation of what the people of God should be doing when they come together into public worship. Rather, Paul is here giving a very specific set of instructions to a very specific church, even only about a very specific set of issues faced by that church. It's not exhaustive. This is very selective. The second thing that we need to recognize is that Paul is giving instructions for the worship of a church that existed during the age of the, age of the apostles. Uh, during the age of the apostles, before the completion of the written New Testament, there continued in use these spiritual gifts of, of, of prophecy and speaking in tongues. And those gifts that were given by God to the early church for the rapid spread and expansion and establishment of Christianity in the world. But then, once the New Testament was completed and once the original apostles died out, those gifts ceased in their use. And so Paul is writing a set of instructions to this church for how they should operate on that side of the age of the apostles, whereas when we gather for worship, we are gathering for worship on this side. And so some of the details of what we are doing are going to change in a little bit. 
So when we come to this passage, uh, we, we need to look at what are the principles that are being taught here? What are, the, what are the principles that Paul is getting at that wasn't just for the early church, but that are for all churches of Jesus Christ, through all ages, in all cultures, in all languages, at all times? And so this morning, Lord willing, we're going to study this passage uh, over the next two weeks, and this morning we're going to look at uh, really the principles for this passage as a whole, try to get a, a bird's-eye view of all of this, what this is getting at. And then next week we'll, we'll, we'll try to work through some of the individual principles uh, more distinctly, one by one. So our big idea this morning is this. In public worship, order builds up the church. In public worship, just like we're doing right now, order builds up the church. And so what we're going to see in this passage is that Paul is navigating a critical distinction, important difference of, of how we think about everything that we are doing as we gather for public worship. On the one hand, here are my two points. First of all, Paul is going to talk about the elements of worship or the elements that we offer as worship. And then second, Paul is going to talk about the order for worship, the order uh, in our worship or for our worship. So two points this morning. Let's start with the first point about the elements as worship. Paul begins this passage uh, with a list of the elements of worship. Uh, in other words, he starts by describing the things that we should do, the what of what we should do as worship to God. And what Paul has been saying all the way through 1 Corinthians 14 is that it isn't up to us about what we do in worship. That we can't just do any old thing that we want to do in worship when we gather. That was why Paul said, Corinth, you think it's a, a beneficial thing in your worship to use all of these untranslated tongues in your worship service. But for so many reasons, that is not admissible. That's not biblical. You can't do that in worship because it doesn't build up the church. It only confuses people because they can't understand the language. It doesn't convert unbelievers to faith in Jesus Christ for them to hear what God has done for them through Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And ultimately, and this is the most important part of it, ultimately, this does not honor God. It's not pleasing to God. Ultimately, because it doesn't reflect his character, as Paul talks about in verse 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. The way that we worship is something that we don't determine for ourselves, but it's something that we have to obey and follow what God tells us to do in worship. Think about the worship this way. Um, think about worship uh, like uh, giving a gift to God. When we gather in worship, God calls us to give Him a gift. It's certainly nothing that we could ever uh, repay Him for anything that He has done, but we're bringing a gift to Him, the gift of our worship to Him. Now, have you ever received a gift that someone was just so excited to give you, and the moment you saw it, you wanted nothing to do with it? You saw it, and you know this person gave a lot of thought to it. They thought there was something about you that you really needed, whatever this was, uh, but you don't want it. And so you have to think, okay, how do I do this politely, and is there a return receipt? All of this kind of thing, right? And what's especially frustrating is if you get this kind of gifts when you provided a registry of the things that you actually wanted and needed, and they ordered something off of the registry, apart from the registry, to give that to you, we've all been there. God has been there too when we worship Him in a way that's apart from the registry He's given us. In His Word, He's told us the kind of gifts that He wants us to bring Him in worship, what's pleasing and acceptable in His sight. And we need to stick to the registry, stick to the Word of God. So, if we can't do just anything we want to do, then what should we do? That's sort of the question that Paul starts off with. And that's what Paul answers in, in, in verse 26. Again, look at verse 26. What then, brothers? How do we apply all this? Well, when you come together, again, that's coming together for public worship, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Now, that list is interesting because in each of the items on that list, Paul is describing the Word of God in different formats. All of these are a description of some aspect of the Word of God, but in a slightly different format each time. Uh, so when we're talking about a hymn, literally that's the word for a psalm. 
Uh, that's the, the, word, the word psalm. So uh, the idea of singing God's word as praises to him. So someone is singing God's word. What about a lesson? Well, this has to do with the preaching and the teaching of God's word. A revelation? Well, again, in those days, this is where there's a difference between how they worshipped on that side of the age of the apostles and how we worship now on that side of the age of the apostles. God was giving his word directly revealed to the people uh, through the prophets in the churches. And sometimes a prophet would receive a revelation of God's word. We'll read about that in verse 30. And they were to share that revelation of the word of God with the congregation. At this point in time, those revelations have ceased because God has given us the whole counsel of God in the written scriptures of the Old and New Testament. So for us, a revelation would look like reading the Word of God, seeing the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, reading the Word of God. And then Paul talks about a tongue or an interpretation. Now, to speak with a tongue was to offer a word of prophecy. It was to offer a word of prophecy in a language that the speaker did not naturally know how to speak. It was a gift to enable the speaker to speak a different language, a prophecy in a different language. Now, if, if, the, if the hearers could speak that language, then that was all well and good. This happened on the day of Pentecost. You have a variety of people speaking a variety of languages, and when the apostles began to speak in tongues, we say, we are hearing the mighty works of God in our own tongues. They were hearing what God had done in sending Jesus Christ into the world to die for their sins and to rise from the dead and to pour out his spirit on them on the day of the Pentecost. But if the congregation does not know that language, if the hearers do not know that language, well, then that tongue needs to be accompanied by an interpretation. And when the interpretation happens, then that prophecy will be put in a language that people can understand the word of God. So again, some of these details are going to be a little bit different on that side of the Age of Apostles than they are for us on this side of the Age of the Apostles. But we can see here a general principle that we need to draw from this. Namely, that the Word of God must have center stage in our public worship. When we come together, we must read the Word, we must sing the Word, we must preach and teach the Word, because God's Word is the necessary content for our worship. Well, why is that the case? Why can't we do just whatever we want to do? It's because, as the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 138, verse 2, God has exalted above all things his name and his word. God loves his word. God's word is the most precious thing he has because by his word, he tells us who he is. God wants us to know him. He wants us to know his heart and his love for us. He wants us to know his plans to send his only begotten son into this world to die for sinners so that we could be forgiven of our sins as we look to Jesus in faith. By his word, God reveals himself. By his word, God saves sinners. By his word, God builds up his church. And by his word, God is honored and glorified and worshiped rightly. Now, the list that Paul gives us in verse 26, which all have something to do with the word of God, again, isn't an exhaustive set of instructions for what we should be doing in our public worship. If you look back up the page a little bit at verse 16, you'll see another element of public worship, uh, the public prayers of, of God's people. Uh, Paul says, otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you are saying? Paul is saying, you're, you're right to offer these public prayers, but you need to offer them in a language they can understand so that the outsider, the one on the fringe, is able to say amen as a response to the prayers. So not only should we be using the word in, in our worship, but also prayers. And then again, think about that word when you come together in verse 26. That was the word that Paul used five times in 1 Corinthians 11 to talk about how we should celebrate the Lord's Supper. The word, the prayer, and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are the outward and ordinary means by which God should be worshipped, what God commands us to do in his word. And we dare not worship him in any other way than what God commands us to do. We dare not bring God a gift from outside of the registry that he has provided for us. This is what we sometimes refer to. You may have heard this phrase. It's called the regulative principle of worship. It means that we can't just pick and choose what we do in worship according to our own minds and imaginations. 
uh, so long as it's not explicitly forbidden, in other words. Instead, we can only do what God explicitly commands. Unless he commands it positively, you must do this in worship, then we cannot bring this into worship. Otherwise, we'll be worshiping God in a way that is not pleasing to him. Now, at one level, if we think about this regulative principle of worship, just word, prayer, sacraments, that sounds simple enough, right? I mean, that's pretty easy, just those simple things. But even when we agree on what should be happening in worship, on the elements of the word, prayer, and the sacraments, a number of other questions arise that are far more difficult to answer about how we should use those elements. Okay, so we're going to use God's word. Which passage should we read from? Uh, which passage should we preach from? We're going to sing songs. Which songs should we sing? How many people should be involved in leading worship? How frequently should we do something like celebrating the Lord's Supper? These are not questions so much of what we do when we come together. That's told for us in the scriptures. These are rather questions about how to use these elements in worship. And perhaps the greatest value of this particular passage, again, even though some of this is so obscure and we're not sure what things would have really looked like on, on that side of the Age of Apostles, one of the enduring values of this passage is that this gives us critical principles for thinking through the how decisions. Not the what of what we should do, but the how of deciding about how to order our worship. So that brings us to our second point, the order for worship. The order for worship. Paul talks about the elements that we offer as worship, the what of worship. But now we need to see how Paul talks about the order for worship, the how of worship. And so to, to see the way Paul is talking about the how of worship, it's important to understand uh, kind of at a bird's eye view of what Paul is doing here. In these 15 verses, Paul is issuing 14 commands. 14 commands. It's just command, 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 command. And it's difficult to see these commands, though, because of some of the uh, limitations of the English language. Um, usually when we give a, a command, we just speak directly to someone, do this or don't do that. And, and you can see that kind of a command in verse 39. So, my brothers, earnestly desire. This is what you should be doing. Do this. Earnestly desire to prophesy. And here's something you shouldn't do. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. But in Greek, there's a different way to make a command that doesn't really correspond to the English language very well, and I'll spare you the, the grammatical details. But if, I want to show you how this is translated so you can see kind of all of the commands that appear through here. Sometimes these commands, they have the same force, the same punch as a command. Sometimes these commands are translated with the word let. So like look at verse 27. If any speak in a tongue, let there be. There must be only two or at most three in each in turn. And let someone interpret. Someone must interpret, in other words. Or other times, uh, these commands are translated with the word should. Look at verse 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge, he must acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. So what is Paul doing here with all of these commands? Well, Paul really gives us an insight into his main overarching purpose by the very first command he gives and the very last command he gives. So in verse 26, look at the first command Paul gives at the very end of verse 26. Paul says, let all things be done for building up. Let all things be done for building up. And then look at the last verse, verse 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. These are commands. All things must be done decently and in order. Notice that in the first and the last command, Paul uses that phrase, all things. This isn't just a very specific set of commandments for a very specific church for their very specific issues. This is how all worship in all churches all cultures, all languages, all times, must offer their worship to God. This is how all things must be done. And we must do things for the building up of the church, and we must do all things decently and in order. Why? Because this is an expression of God's character. Again, verse 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So on the one hand, part of what this passage is doing is giving us a brief list that deals with the elements of what we should do as worship. But when we're talking about these how questions of order, 
we're talking about a different theological category that are called the circumstances concerning worship. And elements and circumstances are different things. So in, in our Confession of Faith, in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, which deals with the Bible, how should we read and interpret the Bible, and then in paragraph 6, I'd encourage you to go home and read this. It's a really helpful paragraph. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, paragraph 6, it actually cites these two verses, verse 26 and 40, on a paragraph about the circumstances concerning worship. So the paragraph starts off by saying that the whole counsel of God is given to us in the Bible. There's nothing more that we need to do. The Bible need to know the Bible is absolutely sufficient for God to tell us everything about worship, everything about our faith, everything about salvation, about what God requires to us, and we will never add anything to the revelation that God gives in His Word. It's fixed. But then it says this, Nevertheless, we acknowledge that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God, common to human actions and societies which are to be ordered... How? By the light of nature, so that's common wisdom, and Christian prudence, so that's Christian wisdom. According to the general rules of the Word, the Bible, which are always to be observed. So with the elements of worship, we have very specific instructions from God's Word, and we must not add a thing to the whole counsel of God in the Bible. But when we come to these circumstances concerning worship, the how of worship, how we go about organizing and ordering and administrating the elements of worship, we have to go not by explicit command that's given, but by these general principles. We have to do what we do in order to build up the church and in order to do thing, all things decently in an order. And so as we look at this as the details here of this passage, and Lord willing, we'll do this next week, we're going to see that Paul is addressing a number of circumstantial issues. Who should speak? How many people should speak? How should we determine who should speak and when? And these are questions we still have to think through every week when we plan out our worship service. And in addition to these circumstantial questions, uh, theologians talk about, often cite a number of other circumstantial issues. Should we use a microphone and an amplification system? Well, I defy you to find a proof text in the Bible that tells us exactly what we should do about a microphone and an amplification system. You won't get that from an explicit instruction. What about heating and air conditioning? We just got a heating and air conditioning uh, re overhaul on this building. We're thankful for that. Should we turn it off during worship? I dare say none of you would want to do that. Should we sit? Should we stand? When should we sit? When should we stand? Again, what Bible passages should we read from or preach from? What songs should we sing? What's important to understand about these how questions is that we're no longer in the realm of biblical faithfulness. We are instead in the realm of wisdom. Not about what God has commanded us explicitly to do in His Word, but rather about the question of what's wise. What best fulfills these general principles? And if these are questions of wisdom, of common wisdom, according to the light of nature, and Christian wisdom, according to the general principles of the Word, that means that these are going to be very difficult questions to answer. And we're going to come to different opinions about this at different times. The Bible is absolutely sufficient, but that does not mean that it answers all of the questions we have. And part of the way that God strengthens our faith, teaches us to trust Him and to rely upon Him, is by leading us to wrestle with these questions of, of the how, of wisdom, to go back to his word, to look again, to seek the counsel of other people, to listen to that counsel, and to revise our ideas, recognizing that I don't have all wisdom. It's not explicitly spelled out in the Bible. And so we need other believers around us to help us to figure out what is wise. Because there's a problem, that if we don't do all things decently and in order, then God's word cannot build up the church. So those are my two points. Let's follow that with two applications. How do we apply the general principles from this passage? Again, we'll look more at the details next week, Lord willing, but the general principles, especially from verses 26 and 40, those all things commands. Well, regarding the elements, the first application is this. Demand strict purity in the elements of what we do as worship to God. Demand strict purity in the elements of what we do as worship to God. 
Again, we cannot make public worship into anything we want it to be. God alone has the authority and the wisdom and the goodness to set what's going to be on his registry, what's in his word, about what we should offer to him as our worship. And so your conscience should be captive to God's word alone in regard to the elements of what we offer as worship. So for us to add unbiblical elements to offer as worship would be to do what the Bible calls binding your conscience, to make your conscience a slave. We would be forcing you to offer worship to God according to our own commands and our own doctrines rather than simply ministering to you what God commands. And you're supposed to be absolutely free from this kind of imposition against your consciences. So if you believe that you ever see this happening, understand you are encouraged to, you have the right to, we would urge you to make a complaint to the session about what you believe to be a binding of your conscience in worship. And I'm going to say we welcome this kind of challenge. Because if we are binding your conscience in what we are doing as worship, we want to repent and to fix it. Because we want to be not right, we want to be concerned with the truth. Because in worship, truth is of the highest importance. Jesus says this in John chapter 4, verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, but the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So therefore, we must demand the purity of truth in our worship. We must demand the word, sacraments, and prayer, and demand those elements for our worship alone. This is why we don't heavily emphasize the liturgical church calendar. The season of Advent and the season of Lent are not commanded by the Bible as seasons for our worship in that sort of a sense. We're commanded to worship Lord's Day by Lord's Day. That's why we don't do those things. This is why we don't incorporate skits or dramas or, or puppet shows or dance into our worship services. Because we want to worship God in the way that He has commanded us to do. Again, we don't want to give God a gift that we think He will like, but that in fact is not the gift that He wants. We must demand strict purity in the elements of worship. The second application is this, that we must be ongoing. This is an ongoing task, graciously flexible about the circumstances and order for how we worship God. We must be graciously flexible about the circumstances and order for how we worship God. Because God has not given us explicit answers to every question we might raise. The Bible is absolutely sufficient but God wants us to work out these issues of wisdom. And so in the several circumstances concerning worship, God has given broad general principles that require wisdom. Verse 26, let all things be done for building up. Verse 40, all things should be done decently and in order. So in the passages of the Bible we select to read and preach from, in the length of the sermons and the songs we select in the order of our service, We've got to recognize, again, we're not in biblical faithfulness issues. We, we are doing the word of God, what, what it requires. Rather, we are in wisdom issue areas. And so you might have any number of criticisms about our worship service, and, and you might be right about any number of those criticisms. But as we think about how to evaluate what we should be doing, we have to distinguish between what's an element and what's a circumstance. Because are we talking about a biblical faithfulness issue or are we talking about a wisdom issue? Those are both critical questions, but they must be dealt with in different things. And so probably the most obvious issue related to this is that some of you are asking a very good question and have asked very good questions. Why should we ever change anything, particularly in this season of changes due to COVID-19? Why should our worship service ever change in the least if it's what God commands us to do in our worship? And so as we've gathered for worship during this time where there's a pandemic through the whole world, we've had to do a lot of wisdom thinking. We can't find an explicit biblical proof text to tell us how to make all of these decisions. So many of them require wisdom. And so as we've thought about the worship service, we recognize that these elements of worship, the word, prayer, sacraments, are fixed. They must not change. But then there's a whole host of issues of circumstances where we can be flexible surrounding those details for a temporary amount of time as we deal with this particular issue and as we're all praying hard for this time to pass. So think about, for example, the issue of singing. Now, I know there are some of you who think that none of us should ever be singing at all without our masks on the entire time. 
And in fact, we started an early worship service to accommodate that concern. And I know there are some of you who think we should never have anything to do with masks. I know both of you are here in this room. I've talked with you. How do we make these decisions? We've tried to do this wisely. We've tried to recognize that singing is a necessary element of worship first and foremost. So look at verse 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn. You have a singing psalm of praise. Singing is a necessary element of worship. Or think about Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How should the word of God dwell in us richly? Well, by teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. That has to do with the lessons that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. But not only by teaching and admonishing other, one another in all wisdom, but also by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So singing is an element. We have to do it. But then there's a question of how many songs we should sing and where we should place them. So for the early service, they only have one song. It's at the very end of the service. Everyone keeps their masks on as they sing. And the goal there is to say we want to honor the element that God has commanded, even if we have to significantly alter the details, the circumstances of how that is done to accommodate the needs of people who have particular health concerns, to try to reduce the risk as much as possible so that people are able to safely come back to worship. But there are a number of these questions. Uh, there, think about our seating procedures. Uh, think about uh, the six-foot spacing that we have between people. Think about all the ways that we, if you've been here from the beginning, all the ways that we've changed and tweaked how we do the Lord's Supper on every given week. Well, none of these are explicitly commanded. Here is the section of the Bible on handling a COVID-19 pandemic. There is rather a lot of general biblical principles that we need to think through wisely and prayerfully and in conversation with a lot of people. Which means that as we think about these things and as we're trying to consider the whole congregation, what will build up everyone in the congregation, we're all going to come to a place where we're going to disagree with things. Would it surprise you to know that I am frequently outvoted on questions of the circumstantial details of our worship service? Whether before or after COVID, I often get outvoted on the things that I want. That's great. I get talked down from my crazy ledge. Uh, but the point is that not even the pastor gets everything he wants. There was actually a major thing that dealt with COVID kinds of things that I came and advocated strongly in one direction. And I appealed to common wisdom, the light of nature, as best I understood it. I appealed to general biblical wisdom, as best I understood it, and I was voted down. I'm not telling you that to gin up support for my position. Quite the opposite. I'm telling you, in that moment, I didn't have to be mad because we weren't dealing with a biblical faithfulness issue. I recognize this is a wisdom issue. And I could rejoice that God hadn't put my deeply limited wisdom as the only one involved in making that decision. God gave multiple officers. Jesus Christ gives multiple officers to the church, church to give us a full sense of what is truly wise. So I know we're at a time where some of you may not think that we should be gathering at all just yet, and some of you think, why are we still sitting so far away from each other? Some of you think that we should be wearing masks through this entire service, and some of you think we shouldn't have anything to do with them. We're going to get to points where we disagree. That happens all the time in the church and that especially happens right now. And how do we handle those? Well, we've got to keep talking. But it's important to understand as we have these conversations, these principles here, that God doesn't command, give us specific commands for every jot and tittle of what's happening in our worship service. Rather, a lot of this is not at the biblical faithfulness level, but at the wisdom level. Both are important discussions. If we're talking about biblical faithfulness, there's no room for discussion. We must obey God. That's a critical discussion to have. But if we're talking about wisdom, then all of us always need to be continually growing in all of our thinking. We want to be a church that is seeking to accommodate everyone. Whatever your opinions are, whatever your needs are, whatever your conscience is on some of these things, we want to accommodate everyone. That's a joy. We want to do all things for building up the church as a whole. And so I want to point out, we've actually implemented a lot of 
uh, ideas of the details for the circumstances uh, from many different members of our congregation. So the idea for an early service, that came from a member who saw this at another church. It was a great idea to accommodate a specific set of people in our congregation. We started doing it as soon as we could. We've changed our communion procedures several times. And even think before COVID, if you were here about five years ago, we did not always celebrate the Lord's Supper weekly. That frequency question is a circumstantial issue. How often? That's a question of wisdom, not biblical faithfulness. God doesn't command us to celebrate the Lord's Supper every time we come together. But so we judged it wise to do that weekly. Uh, you may remember a couple of years ago that we only served wine, but we switched to offer grape juice with the wine to deal with the consciences of people who didn't believe they could drink alcohol at all. We switched to gluten-free bread to try to build up those in the congregation with celiac disease and gluten intolerances who couldn't eat normal bread, and we wanted to all partake of one loaf. We don't have a bread recipe or a wine recipe in the scriptures. These are wisdom issues, not biblical faithfulness issues. Even last week... I received a suggestion about a tweak to our communion procedures, and we've made several, many suggested by the congregation as they look at, at, at how difficult this is, about what we are doing, and we're considering that tweak right now. By all means, if you think there's a wiser way to do something that we're doing, please suggest it to the elders of the deacons. But as we do this, again, just let's all have this attitude of joy and bearing with one another. Uh, we may not think that everything we are doing is completely wise, and that's okay. It, it certainly isn't. But we can nevertheless, uh, we must pursue being graciously flexible. And, and in my own heart, I like to keep my own heart in check sometimes by thinking about Job, uh, biblical Job, uh, Old Testament. He suffered in a lot of ways, and his friends came along, looked at his situation, and said, surely you must be suffering because of something wrong you did. That wasn't the case. But they thought too much of their own wisdom and their own opinions, and so Job rebuked them by saying, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. You've got it all together, all figured out, huh? Let's none of us ever have this attitude. Let's do everything we can to listen to one another, to respect one another. And first and foremost, to do all things for building up the church, and to do all things decently and in order. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would build up your church through decent and in-order worship as we try to faithfully do everything you have commanded us to do in worship. We pray this not for our own glory, but for the good and building up of your people and for the glory of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen.